Well, the tastiest ones are grasshoppers. They're delicious. I think grasshoppers uh, can rival, you know, chicken, the flavour. If global food waste were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. If we would be to make the meat in a controlled way, so make cultivated meat instead, a lot of that land will be released. Welcome to Emissions Impossible. I'm Kim McAllister. I'm Maya Elliott. And I'm Riaz Bounou. Now, I am a broadcast journalist, but I am joined by two experts when it comes to our food system. Maya, what's your role? So I work for Global Food Security, and my role is really to engage the public and stakeholders with the food security challenge. And Riaz? So I'm um, director of the Global Food Security Programme. And my role is about bringing together the major public sector funders of food security research to try and improve coordination and collaboration. This is going to be a great discussion. But before we go into the detail of the research, which is amazing, I'm really interested in your personal attitudes to food. Because me, for example, I eat everything. I have tried to be vegan. I lasted four days because I love cheese. But Maya, you've managed to go vegan and stick with it, which is just amazing. Yeah, I actually went vegan when I started at GFS because um, I think I was given a lot of reading to do to familiarize myself with parts of the food system that I hadn't been engaging with until then. I was really shocked. Um, So the way that I see my food is, or my dietary choices, is just a kind of way of engaging with the realities of our food system and not being crippled by guilt, I guess. And also, yeah, feeling like I'm doing something positive until we figure out how to make our food system healthier more sustainable I see this as my little way of doing my bit and do you miss cheese uh I grew up in the Netherlands and cheese was about 50 percent of my diet um, <laughs> <laughs> it was it was really painful but actually living in the UK where I don't enjoy the cheese as much made it a lot easier for me to then quit and I've I've lost the taste for it now Okay, so maybe I should go back and try this. Maybe the the cheese will will disappear from my palate. What about you, Riaz? I'm flexitarian, which means I occasionally eat meat. In in this sort of role, you're exposed to the evidence and you see the evidence. I guess my reading of it at the moment is that we need to what we need to really do is reduce the amount of of meat we eat. And you know, the Committee on Climate Change suggests you know reducing meat consumption by at least 35 percent to meet net zero by 2050. So so for that reason, then I, I eat less meat. You know. Because if demand for meat goes down, then that frees up land. So, so I, I think livestock can be part of a healthy ecosystem. It's just that we're eating too much of it at the moment. Yeah. And just a fun fact about meat production and land. Um, currently, 85% of the land associated with food production, our food production at home and abroad, is used for meat and dairy production. So actually reducing the amount of meat and dairy that we eat it just has this incredible potential to free up land for reforestation, for you know regenerating biodiversity, for producing green energy. And the sooner we do it, the sooner we can get serious about tackling climate change. And uh, I would also add to that, you know, the, the 85 percent um, provides a third of our calories, whereas the 15 remaining 15 percent, which is used to grow plant based foods, provides two thirds of our calories. So there's a massive efficiency question there. That, that needs to be rebalanced urgently, doesn't it? Definitely. Yeah. So how important is food then when it comes to climate change? Well, food from production through to consumption is responsible for up to a third of all greenhouse gas emissions. And for comparison, air travel is about three and a half percent. And if we project forward, then if diets continue as they are, food on its own could account for the majority of our annual carbon budget for limiting warming to two degrees C, let alone 1.5 degrees. And there are, I would say, three major ways that the food system contributes to climate change. So firstly, the release of two very potent greenhouse gases, methane and nitrous oxide. So methane from livestock digesting their food, or from the wet soils of rice paddies, or from food waste rotting down, and nitrous oxide from fertilisers and manure that are applied to crops or grasslands. And then secondly, there's the release of carbon dioxide when wild lands are converted to farmland. 
for example, through deforestation. And then thirdly, the use of fossil fuels in every part of the food system. I would just also just flag that climate change is already having and will absolutely continue to have an impact on the food system itself. It'll affect what we can grow and where, and there'll likely be a change in the spread of pests and diseases. You know, warmer, wetter winters and hotter, dry summers will mean different pests thrive. So the food system uniquely will be directly impacted by climate change, while simultaneously being one of its biggest drivers. That's quite sobering, isn't it? To think of it in those terms. <laughs> and, and, that, and that is why that is why we undertook to look at different scenarios that might mm. lead to us achieving, you know, reduced emissions, better environmental outcomes and better health outcomes at, all at the same time. So it's clear something has to change. I mean, we cannot continue like this. So Maya, tell me about the research that you've been doing about these scenarios for change. Yeah, so... I've been working for a couple of years with a small team of academics to develop future food system scenarios that explore what kind of challenges or opportunities we might face in the future if we were to transform our food system to meet our climate targets. And so one of the things that we recognised quite early on is that our food system has the incredible potential to help us meet our climate targets, but it can also do so much more than that. If we were to transform our food system to meet, for example, the Sustainable Development Goals, which are the 17 goals developed by the UN, as well as climate change, then we could achieve so much more than just with a sole focus on our climate targets. So what we did was we developed four scenarios. Two of them are scenarios that focus solely on meeting our climate targets and how we might achieve that in the UK if we were more self-sufficient or less self-sufficient. And then the other two scenarios look at um, what might the outcomes be if we were to transform our food system, taking into account all the 70 sustainable development goals, including climate action, in a more localised or a more globalised setting. They are evidence-based, but they are not predictions of the future, and we are not advocating for these specific pathways. They are just to stimulate thought and discussion about what kind of future food system we want to create. So for example, the carbon neutral scenario, um, we adopted vertical farming, which means growing our food indoors, which requires far less land. And I think that we used renewable energy sources in order to power these um, indoor farms. The communal scenario, which was a more localised, also more localised scenario, but focused on kind of wider metrics of sustainability. There we saw a redistribution of wealth and land. So quite radical. The diversification of what we grow in the UK was the shift towards kind of greener diets and eating lots of different kinds of food instead of just having monoculture was one way that we were able to address climate change, but also increase the health of the population. The Third scenario was a more globalised scenario where we actually gave up agricultural land in the UK and imported more of our food. And we used that land for reforestation and plantation forests that stored a lot of carbon and allowed us to meet our climate targets that way. And then the final scenario was also quite radical, focusing on those wider metrics of sustainability in a more globalised setting. And in this scenario, there were global governance agreements about which foods are most efficient to grow in different parts of the world and with minimal kind of negative impacts on the environment and on communities, but with maximum yields. And so in the UK, we became a world class exporter of livestock products and meat was a real luxury. In all of these scenarios, there was a shift towards less meat consumption. There was a massive reduction in food waste and the cost of food interestingly went up in all of the scenarios as well. So there's little things that even though they're not predictions of the future, we can take away, start preparing for if we want to get really serious about transforming our food system to tackle climate change. Wow. I mean, I, I'm going to need to take a few minutes to digest that quite literally. <laughs> That's just, it's incredible, the potential there for change and that there's going to be all these amazing outcomes, but there's going to be a huge shift required. It's clear from what we've heard already that we can't continue like this, right? We cannot keep being so greedy at bottom line. <laughs> we need to start making some more sustainable choices. So I think this is a good time to bring in our first interviewee because he's just brilliant. He's so much fun and he thinks that we should all be eating insects. So, Peter, I have to ask you, do you eat insects? I do, yeah. I mean, not as regularly as I used to. 
Pete Bickerton has a PhD in plant science and now works as a science writer for the Erlum Institute. Which insects in particular are on your menu? Well, the tastiest ones are grasshoppers. Mm. They're delicious. I think a lot of people eat crickets and mealworms, but I'm not sure about crickets and mealworms. I don't think the flavour's there. But I think grasshoppers uh, can rival, you know, chicken, the flavour. And do you sauté them with butter? Do you grill them? How do you cook them? Or do you just eat them whole live? Definitely not alive. So the, the, the best way to cook, well, grasshoppers at least, is to roast them as you would if you were making a tasty meal for yourself, if you were just using meat or veg or something, you know, with a bit of sweet chilli sauce. I can recommend roasted locusts with a bit of Nando's hot sauce. That's pretty good. And do you have it as a main meal or as an appetizer? <laughs> No, I don't think it's, I don't think people, it's a, it's a replacement for a main meal. It's more of an addition, you know, if you, if you think more like the Italians or the Spanish eat, for example, rather than like a, a full meal that you would get in an English pub, I think it makes more sense. It's a, a little plate of locusts, a nice addition to your meal without it being the main part of the meal. Wow. I'm definitely going to try this. I'm up for this. <laughs> you eat the whole beast. You don't cut the legs off or anything like that. If it was a grasshopper, I would recommend getting the legs off because okay. they're a bit spiky. Oh, right, okay. You can do what you want with the heads, but they're fine, I'm pretty sure. And the wings, the wings get stuck to the back of your throat. Right. Uh, so if you have a mature one, the mature ones have wings, they'll take those off. It's not a million miles from eating a shrimp, is it really? It largely tastes quite similar, to be honest, as well, I think. There's more yucky bits in a shrimp. I mean, I love, <laughs> eating, I love eating shrimp, but when you get a whole shrimp with a shell on and you kind of rip the head off, you get all that kind of gunge. You don't really That's get that with a, with a grasshopper. Yeah, you're supposed to suck the head of a shrimp, aren't you, if you're a proper gastronome. Oh, is that right? Yeah. It's got all sorts of protein in there, apparently. I'll try that next time. It's just a bit stinky, isn't it, that bit? <laughs> so why are you so fond of eating grasshoppers and insects? What do you think the benefits are? I suppose, in a way, I'm a lot less militant about this now than I might have been once upon a time. I mean, in theory, the benefits are quite wide-ranging, aren't they, really? I think in terms of di diversifying your diet... I think they've got a nutrient profile, which is quite favorable. So it depends on the insect, right? But, you know, a grasshopper is quite high in protein, maybe not quite as high as a cow, but it also comes with a lot of other vitamins and minerals and nutrients that are good for you. It's almost like bridging the animal and plant diet. <laughs> they contain a lot of things that are good for you that you might not find in high quantities in a plant-based diet. Okay. At the same time, they probably contain less what we regard as unhealthy ingredients, maybe like saturated fats and things like that. It's, it's a challenge with grasshoppers and stuff, but in theory, you know, you can grow a lot more insects in a smaller space using fewer inputs than you could with most meat. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's comparable with, say, chicken, for example. Mm -hmm. It's more sustainable than a lot of the meat people consume. And do you think it's an industry that's going to grow as we become more aware of what we're eating and where it's coming from? It's a good question, isn't it? I think that... I've been talking about this for years now, and I think when I first started talking about it, I think there was still the, I don't know, the kind of drive to get people to eat bugs. I tend to think that there's still a certain yuck factor, so I'll be interested to see what happens. I think it's, it is a growing industry, I know it is, I've got friends who are in the industry, but I'd say that the ones who are most successful are, are diversifying how they approach the topic, so... I've got friends who, in Indonesia, it's a company called Biteback, <laughs> they take mealworms and kind of those sort of grubby type things and they make oil, right? So they make cooking oil. So instead of eating the insect, you can cook with the insect and it's a, it's a sustainable alternative to palm oil, basically. So they're solving a different sustainability problem. Mm -hmm. um, I've also got friends who grow insects as animal feed. So rather than us eating the bugs they grow things like black fly larvae so you can use waste from farms you can use waste from supermarkets you can use food waste green waste and grow bugs on that and then put that back into the agricultural system so a lot of the waste you know a lot of the unsustainability in a lot of agriculture is down to waste rather than the thing that's growing i think that is going to be probably apart from protein bars and these cricket based protein shakes i think the real growth in the industry will be raising insects for animal feed and that sort of thing that might be a better entry level for people to you know use it as an oil and ease them in gently rather than doing a kind of i'm a celebrity get me out of your challenge plate in front of them kind of thing i think so i like the idea of an insect oil i must admit and also i'm thinking there are so many cultures around the world where eating insects is just normal and not something to kind of exclaim over i'm thinking of eating snails in france can't say i entirely enjoyed it but i still did it 
I was going to ask you about that because I, I had a snail for the first time in Piemonte about a month and a half ago. <laughs> I had a whole plate of snails and they have these beautiful plates in Paris, which have got like little, they're almost like little dimples and their little shells sit in them and they're garlic and they're, mm. I mean, they're a strange consistency, but they're garlic, which is always good. Yeah, I, I get I get the consistency points a bit weird. You, you've had, you've lived in Barcelona for a year. Apparently I heard from my Spanish landlady that an original paella should have rabbit and snails in it. Yep. So, and I tried one and it was amazing. Well, again, it's a flavour, isn't it, that the snail imparts into the whole rice dish. So I think when things are hidden, people aren't quite so squeamish. You know, we're obviously aware that we should be consuming less red meat. I think that's yeah. fairly widely accepted now. And I think it's a pretty easy thing to replace with things like corn mince, for example. Do you see insects doing the same kind of thing? <laughs> it's a good question. I think if you were to get over the fact that it's not something you're used to eating, a grasshopper, for example, as I've mentioned, is a genuine replacement for something meaty. If anyone's squeamish, you know, maybe turn the volume down now. But, you know, you end up getting curious and you dissect these things, right, when you've got them in your kitchen. And they're quite meaty. You know, they've got big muscles. Locusts can hop for a long way right they've got what you would i would refer to as meat inside them mm -hmm. if they were available and people could you know could get which they are if you've got pet lizards but <laughs> <laughs> my um, friend does have a pet lizard but he gets them alive and you can hear them jumping around in the box yeah that's the ones i i have been known to get so do you just put them in the oven alive or do you bop them over the head no, like <laughs> i feel that's cruel i don't think i could do that to a lobster either i think uh the best way to freeze them i think because they just go to they sleep. Kind of go into this kind of turper and then they slow down and then they eventually kind of die. It's not, but I believe it's not as bad <laughs> <laughs> um, as just sticking. Yeah, no, it's best to freeze them, really. Okay, good. Um, if you do get your packet of locusts, some of them unfortunately come deceased. So it's better to get a, a see through packet so you can see which ones are maybe not edible. I suppose it's like mussels, isn't it? You have to look for the ones that don't open when they've been steamed and you don't eat yeah. those ones. Yeah, exactly. See? It's not that weird. I think I could get on board with this. <laughs> How much would a bag of freeze-dried locusts cost a person? The more you do it, the cheaper it becomes. But at the moment, locusts, for example, are the delicacy for, uh, for me anyway. Uh, they're quite hard to grow in this country. So mm. come back to sustainability, you know, is it more sustainable here? Not sure. But yeah, to buy them from a breeder, I mean, y your friends who've got reptiles will know it's not very cheap. I mean... Mm -hmm. I would say, but then, you know, people pay the premium for a, a steak, don't they? So I wouldn't say it's much, I wouldn't say it's probably comparable. Is it the sort of thing that you could home grow? Yeah, yeah, you could. I mean, it depends how squeamish you are. <laughs> and what your neighbours are saying about it. Yeah, but you could. I mean, you know, one of my, one of our good friends at university, whilst he was a student on the side, he used to raise uh, cockroaches and things. I mean, it's doable. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm, I draw the line. <laughs> <laughs> right, cockroaches. Sorry. Uh huh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. We had a bit of an incident where one of our friends bought some from him and they, they broke loose. <laughs> in fact, I've had a worse one. I mean, I got some crickets and I put them in the freezer, but the problem is you have to put them in there for a certain amount of time before they fully freeze. And once I got a bit carried away, we wanted to make some cricket burgers and I took them out a bit too early. <laughs> and a couple of them kind of unfroze and skedaddled around the house uh, to run around for a while. Wow. The problem is as well, you get some of them which make a chirping noise, so they just sit under your freezer for about mm, two months. Annoying you. Have you eaten an ant before? Yeah, I got some delivered from Colombia before. It's quite it's quite a delicacy, a giant leaf cutter ant. They taste a bit like popcorn. Oh. For insects, you probably need to find a way to raise them rather than just harvest them from the wild. Mm -hmm. An insect farm. Yeah. It's the breakout. I think you'd have to do it in like a vertical farming system. Mm. I think I've worked out how that would be more sustainable. Like I came up with an idea once for it. You could, if you were re rearing the right insects, which is why I think the oils and the uh, supplements are quite a good bet because you can grow things like mealworms in containers and there's not really many animal rights worries. Mm -hmm. And you can kind of grow them in, you know, upwards. So in the same area, you can produce a hell of a lot more. Mm. So it sounds like, Oils and derivatives are the most likely way to create more of a sustainable food source out of insects than eating them on a plate as a replacement for a steak. I think so, yeah. So what do you reckon, Riaz? Could you be tempted to eat a grasshopper? I could be tempted to eat a grasshopper. I have I have tried insects before. I'm not sure it was a fair experiment, really, because 
the insects I ate were from a bag, and I don't know how long they'd been around. So, but, but my, <laughs> my general my general view on them on eating those insects were they tasted a bit like peanuts that had been in a cupboard for several months. So, not very <laughs> appetizing. Um, but you know, I know there's a big movement in terms of eating insects. Obviously, two billion people could globally already eat them. If if they were produced by a chef, you know, with, with lots of flavorings and that sort of thing i think i think i could be tempted i guess short term for me it's more about grinding them up into products like like burgers for example rather than actually seeing them but i still have a bit of yuck factor i think yes yeah. some of the public probably do as well i i like the idea of using worms and sort of grubs as as an oil base i mean think that's a, a wee bit more palatable to sort of ease you in gently i mean my i'm assuming you would not eat insects as a vegan not necessarily i i'm predominantly a vegan for environmental reasons and there are there are ways that we can make insects incredibly uh, sustainable so for example if we fed insects our food waste and then were to consume those insects, then that would be a circular, an example of a, a circular system. I think I would participate then, actually. Oh, that's um, interesting. Okay, well, there's there's so much technology, and I guess that's part of what the Biotechnology and Biological Sciences Research Council is all about, is using technology and using all the amazing science to find alternatives for us. Here's another question for you, and I'm interested in your take on this, Maya. Cultivated meat, so meat that is made in a lab effectively but does not kill any animals or harm any animals but is still a steak where do you sit on that oh tricky i also lost my taste for flesh as a result of just not eating it for a really long time and the other day i tried a, a burger that was so close to the actual thing it they've really really got the texture down to a t yeah, I didn't enjoy it for some reason. So I don't think that cultured meat would be would be my jam, but I can definitely see it being extremely popular um, with everybody else. In 2013, it cost about £200,000 in order to produce one burger, one of these like cultivated meat burgers. And five years later, the price is now £8. Wow. That's yeah. science in action right there. <laughs> incredible, isn't it? That's amazing. And what about you, Rias? Because you mentioned the yuck factor when we were talking about insects. Do you have the yuck factor when we're talking about synthetic steak? Um, not so much, funnily enough, actually. Um, so I, I also would be tempted to eat cultured meat. And I think with these things, you have to look at the benefits. In theory, it could prevent the slaughter of lots, a, a lot of animals. You know, it could stop animal to human transmission of disease, environmental things in terms of, of emissions and, and water use. So there's lots of positives, I think. I guess the only thing actually with insects and, and cultured meat is the energy use. For insects, it's, it's, it's heated tanks, and with, with cultured meat, it uses a lot of energy. So, actually, um, what can happen is if, if we were to scale it, Maya mentioned the cost, huge, huge cost, and that's a big factor um, in terms of affordability and people buying it. But if we were able to scale it, you know, we'd have to move to clean energy because otherwise, you're then producing CO2, which lasts in the atmosphere for a very long time, you know, compared to methane from livestock, which only lasts a short amount of time in the atmosphere, then goes. Um, so there are there are trade offs. Well, luckily, we have an expert to tell us more about this whole science behind creating steaks in a lab. So Petra Hanger is going to chat to us about how that even happens. My research is about um, producing meat without the animals. Uh, so you might think, what, what is that exactly? How, how would that work? That's exactly <laughs> what I'm thinking. <laughs> the type of meat that I am talking about, or at least the concept of meat without the animal that I'm talking about, you might have heard of it as, as cultivated meat, or you might have heard of it as clean meat, cultured meat, cell-based meat, or even in some newspapers as synthetic meat, but essentially it's exactly the same thing. Okay. Um, so it's, it's meat, real meat, like the one that we normally eat, but is made without using the animal. What we are using is just a very small sample of tissue from the animal from which we, we collect the cells. And essentially from those cells, we, we produce meat. I don't like to say in the lab, but that's what, what actually happens. But we produce it in a controlled way. 
So the idea is that it will have the same texture, the same taste, the same uh, nutritional value, actually maybe even improved compared to animal-based meat. So meat that we get from from farming animals. Mm -hmm. Um, And when I say, uh, you know, improved nutrition, I'm referring to uh, we would be able to, uh, for example, take off the cholesterol, which we know is quite bad for us, and replace it with good fats, put in things like omega-3 oils, by producing meat in, in a controlled way, we actually have that ability to, to supplement it and make it better and wow. more nutritious. So forgive me for being so crude, but are you playing God? No. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I don't, yeah, I don't want to think of it like that. I think what what I am doing and some of the other groups worldwide we're trying to do here is trying to improve the system trying to improve some of the the things that have been caused by intense animal farming. Essentially, it's about making meat that is better for us, is healthier, but guilt-free. And I say that because, you know, I think there's there's very few of us that, that can answer the question, do you know where the meat that you are eating comes from? We need to think differently we need to produce meat differently because you know the way we are currently producing it is not sustainable it's not healthy it's not Mm. healthy for us it's not healthy for the animals Mm. so you take a biopsy from the animal you take those stem cells you then grow them in your amazing scientific way into muscle cells i assume if you're making steaks for example Do you also grow fat cells to get that lovely flavor that we associate with a steak? Yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, think of it as, as a combination of different cell types, right? So you have the muscle, which is the biggest part of, of meat, but then you also need that fat. Depending on what type of meat or what cut of meat you're trying to, to achieve, there will be a certain proportion of fat in there. And you're absolutely right. The fat is key for, for that taste because when you cook the meat, the fat renders and, you know, all that goodness, it just gives it that amazing taste. That kind of blows my mind, Petra, that human beings are clever enough to be able to do that. But also I'm wondering if you're clever enough to do that and you can grow essentially a piece of steak, why are we then eating it? It feels like a little bit more precious than something to just stick on your dinner. You know, it feels like we should be using it for other purposes, surely. Yeah, I mean, the same, exactly the same techniques are are used in production of therapeutics now. So you might have heard, you know, on TV about immunotherapies that have been used to uh, essentially beat cancer or certain types of cancer, and those have been successful. For this, we're using exactly the same techniques. The difference is that rather than using human cells, which you would use for therapies, you use bovine or you use porcine, depending on what you're trying to what kind of meat you're trying to produce mm. uh, beef or pork or chicken <laughs> wow have you tasted it uh not yet so there is only um so far there's only one company that has received uh, re- regulatory approval and is commercializing it and that's in singapore um, they're, they're doing these cultivated chicken nuggets, uh, which is quite exciting. It was it was one of the uh, very big milestones for, for the industry as well. And that was in, in December 2020, so now not long ago. Mm. Um, we are expecting more companies to, you know, to be able to do this and, and bring cultivated meat products to the market. So fingers crossed in the next year or so, uh, you know, we'll, we'll have more and hopefully It will be cheap enough to be affordable. It's completely amazing. And once you get over the strangeness of it and the sort of, I don't know, the the psychology of eating something that's not quite come from where you might expect, you can see the potential for a sustainable food source, right? Oh, for sure. For sure. If you think about the way we are producing meat now through animal farming, the industry is using, it's already using a lot of resources. It's using 77% of arable land 
it's using 23% of fresh water and that's just to grow the animals. Wow. So you imagine, you know, in the context of the whole planet, that is huge. That's a quarter. Huge. That's crazy. Yeah. If we would be to make the meat in a controlled way, so make cultivated meat instead, a lot of that land will be will be uh, released and we could use that for, for housing. We could use that for other things, other useful things. It's, it's already done a lot of damage even on, on the environment. So, you know, in order to get that 77% of arable land, a lot of the forests had to be knocked down. And that is bad. I mean, we know forests are, are critical, you know, for the planet. Because of that, a lot of biodiversity was lost as well, which, you know, is, is quite, it's quite heartbreaking to think that so many, you know, wild, wildlife species are now close to being extinct. How are we going to keep doing this when, you know, the natural resources are running out? You know how many uh, live animals are now currently on the planet just for uh, protein productions, just so animal farming? There's about a hundred billion of those animals. A and, and hundred billion? 100 There's billion. not space for a hundred billion animals exactly. as so well as all the people. Yeah. And I love speaking to you about your work because you're so passionate about it. And you just, you know, it's something that kind of makes people go, oh, wow. Oh, that's different. But the more you think about it and the more you discuss it, the more you think this is amazing. This has amazing potential. And it's just a choice for people. It's not one of these kind of draconian this is the future, you must eat this. It's just another choice that people have to make, right? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, I mean, when cultivated meat products will come to the market, it will all be about giving consumers a choice. It wouldn't be about forcing people. Everyone will have to make their own conscience choice. But, you know, who doesn't want to eat meat guilt-free? Petra Hanga there and some incredible research and innovation going on. And that's such a big part of what UKRI does, isn't it, Riaz? That's right. Um, and if, if we look at the challenge, you know, we outlined some of the challenges around emissions from the food system um, and, and how food interacts with climate change. I think overall, what we need to do is reduce food waste by around a half, reduce meat consumption by at least a third to free up land for nature or to grow crops for human consumption. And then we need to use the best innovations and practices to grow as much as we can on the land available for agriculture in, in the most sustainable way um, so that that additional land is then not converted to agriculture instead. And to achieve that, I think there's a big role for research and innovation. Um, and UKRI funds world-class bioscience, environmental science, um, economics and social science. And examples here include you know, plant and livestock genetics, different feeds for livestock and methane inhibitors, precision farming, soil science, reducing losses to pests and diseases, regenerative farming, behaviour change and new business models, that, that the list goes on. Um, I'd just flag two big research programmes though that we're currently funding that I think are, are quite interesting. There's one which is worth £90 million called Transforming Food Production and that is about helping industry and researchers to develop innovative new technologies for food production for net zero by 2040. Um, and examples here include turning carbon dioxide into animal feed, uh, vertical growing systems and growing food from algae in deserts. And then there's a second program called Transforming the UK Food System for Healthy People and a Healthy Environment, worth £47 million. And that is about tackling the obesity em epidemic while sim simultaneously reducing emissions and other environmental impacts. And the, the key question we want to address there is if, if we were to you know, start again and put health and the environment right at the heart of our food system, what would we eat? What would we produce and manufacture? And then what would we import, particularly in the UK? Uh, and how do you make that happen in practice? And to help with that, we've co-designed the research across different disciplines, because every discipline has a contribution to make, and different stakeholders like policy, business, and civil society. And the key aim is to try and drive that evidence into action. That's wonderful. And so reassuring for people like me who just worry about the issues that we're facing and just feel so overwhelmed. So to know that there's literally millions being invested into finding better ways is, is really reassuring. I'm going to sleep a little better tonight. Thank you, Riaz. <laughs> and Maya, if we do want to make changes personally, because I've just said you feel so small, you're only one of billions of people, but you know, if each of us does something, it all contributes, right? So what can we do? Absolutely. I mean, we need widespread system change, but every single one of us has such an important role to play in our food system because we're all connected through food. Those of us who have um, the privilege of choice, it's really important that we use that privilege in order to shape 
a healthier, more sustainable food system. So three things that hopefully most of us will be able to do immediately in order to yeah do our little part for climate change. First one is to reduce red meat consumption. This frees up land for reforestation and biodiversity, um, peatland restoration, all of these kind of amazing carbon sinks. It also means shifting towards more plant-based proteins. And there are a lot of plant-based proteins like lagoons that fix nitrogen in the soil from the atmosphere. And in doing so, that reduces the need for fertilizers and improves soil health. And fertilizers are a key source of emissions in the food system. You're combating climate change through shifting to plant-based in two ways, not just one. Excellent. Um, The second kind of tip, I guess, would be to eat local when it's in season. Eating tomatoes in the UK when they're in season, there's very few um, miles involved between farm and plates. Local is not always better, but it definitely is when it's in season, particularly if it's native. My third tip, final one, is to drastically reduce our food waste. If food waste, global food waste, were a country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world. Great tips. And I, yeah, I can totally see that happening in my life because, for example, I love a roast chicken, but then I'll always take the bones and make soup from it. And I feel like it's a tiny thing, but at least it's not, there's no waste and you get a great meal the next day out of it as well. Yeah, you don't need to go vegan in order to reduce your red meat consumption. Even switching from red meat to white meat drastically reduces the carbon footprint of of your meal. I think we all have different views on what we find acceptable. With food security, there is no single solution. But I think ultimately what's required is collective and simultaneous action across the food system from government, from the food industry, and, and from us as citizens. And I think that's the only way we can drive change. And, you know, as citizens, many of us can vote with our wallets to drive what food businesses supply us with. We can vote at the ballot box to, to drive what policies we want governments to put into place. I think the power ultimately lies with the people. We just have to use it. And if we do all use our power, then we're one step closer to making emissions impossible. Emissions Impossible is a Connect production for UK research and innovation. If you like what you hear, please hit subscribe.